singularity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoyed this podcast, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. Number one is you can go and write a brief review on iTunes, or you can simply go to interviewthefuture.com and make a donation. Today, for the third time in the history of our podcast, we have a Canadian science fiction author and professional futurist, Carl Schroeder. Uh, Carl is a fantastic uh, author of a number of uh, very interesting books that we have discussed previously. And if you guys are not familiar with him and his work, I highly suggest that you check out the previous two interviews that I have already done with him to, uh, before. Because today we're going to focus on three general topics. First of all, we're going to invite Carl to enlighten us about how a professional futurist like himself looks at the future and the major trends that are happening. Then we're going to focus on one particular tool that futurists and foresight experts use that's called strange making and more specifically how strange making can hopefully be applied in a productive or constructive way with respect to our current ongoing COVID-19 global pandemic. And finally, uh, we would probably talk a little bit about the importance of narratives uh, and so on. So, Carl, welcome back to Singularity FM. Uh, thank you so much for having me back. Uh, I've, I've so much enjoyed the, the, the previous interviews and I've been looking forward to this one. Excellent, excellent. So we're going to challenge you uh, a lot today and, and you had uh, to, to kind of uh, think about what you wanted to, to tell us today. So hopefully, I, I believe as always, you're going to have some mind-blowing ideas and suggestions for us all. But speaking about the previous interviews, I had a lot of feedback telling me that I have spoken a little bit too much uh, and that I have been cutting you off a little bit too much. Uh, and therefore, I would try to shut up a lot more this time. I will do my best to give you a lot more of the podium than I've given you before. And so let us start with perhaps uh, the fundamentals of uh, futurism. And the way a professional like you, uh, applying the principles of foresight, looks at the present and the trends and what it tells us about the possible futures that we may be witnessing. Sure. Um, about a hundred years ago, uh, just as quantum mechanics was coming on, uh, on the field, uh, Western society was sort of steeped in, in the idea of determinism, the idea that um, if you, for instance, knew all the positions of all the particles in the universe and had the right equation, you could just project forward and, and, and know what was going to happen. Um, as a science fiction writer, I'm, 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 you know, of course, familiar with the classic book about that, uh, uh, Isaac Asimov's Foundation, um, in, in which someone actually comes up with the, 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 the equations for history and is able to um, uh, project forward to, to find out what is going to happen. Um, and this is a, a great idea. And uh, early futurists um, were quite interested in, in the, the idea of predicting the future. Because we've been trying to predict the future for thousands of years using uh, chicken bones and uh, yarrow sticks <laughs> and uh, you know all, all manner of things. Uh, my my favorite one is extispacy, which is the um, uh, examination of the intestines of cattle that have been hit by lightning. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So o o over the aeons, we've come up with all kinds of uh, techniques to try and see the future, because the problem is that. Um, the future seems to be impossible to know, but it's also absolutely necessary to know. And we as humans are trapped in this dilemma. Um, so the idea that there could be a, um, a rigorous science discipline to do this was very exciting. Um, and to some extent, you can predict the future. Um, uh, for instance, I can tell you exactly what time the sun will rise 
on August the 14th, 3055. Um, that's physics. And there are a lot of physical processes that are absolutely predictable. Um, but they're not actually the ones too interested in these days. We've already nailed that. We, we know when to, to start planting our crops, uh, which was why we built uh, you know, Stonehenge and, and other astronomies back in the day. We figured that stuff out. What we don't really understand is how to predict human beings. Uh, and uh, we also don't understand how to um, predict sudden shocks like the COVID-19 virus. But for a while, people thought maybe, maybe they could. So um, uh, early futurists styled themselves as, as systems thinkers, uh, following uh, all, all the, the paths and flows of energy and, and, and people and so forth in, in society and tried to protect those ahead. Um, to some extent, again, we can still do this. Um, systems thinking is extremely valuable. But the, the, the main thing that we've learned uh, over, I'd say, the last 40 years ago or, or so, is that um, uh, the things that we really care about are the things that are fundamentally unpredictable because we don't live in a deterministic universe, as it turns out. Uh, we live in one in which uh, various different agents of change are all acting simultaneously. And while we can look at trends and while we can look at uh, innovations and, and things like that, um, we can't actually say what is going to happen. Uh, this has given rise to uh, uh, a, a new and I think much more mature form of uh, uh, foresight that doesn't concern itself so much with uh, prediction. So when I tell people that I'm futu a futurist, uh, they often say, oh, predict something for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I say, no, that's not what I do. Um, the, there's something much important that uh, foresight does, and that's prepare people and organizations for the unpredictable. In other words, um, uh, we're here basically to inoculate you against change, uh, or even more, uh, to put it even more concisely, to inoculate you against surprise. Um, foresight has become the science of surprise. And uh, what I try and do is I uh, try and uh, see what surprises could be out, out there, uh, but more importantly, how people and uh, the organizations that, are, that they are in are um, prepared for surprise, how resilient they are, um, how quickly they can turn, and how many options they have open to them. Um, and try and inoculate them against surprise and uh, give them the tools to, for instance, surprise their competitors, um, which is a, 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 an equally valuable uh, tool. So what are the fundamental tools to inoculate oneself, whether individually or collectively as a corporation, organization, a state, uh, or a simple citizen, uh, or a professional, how do you, what are the, the fundamental tools or principles that would allow us to even attempt doing that? Well, one of the most fundamental uh, tools for um, inoculating yourself against change is to recognize uh, what your default future is. In other words, to recognize uh, the things that you don't think can change or, or, or that, that, that will change. Uh, we all walk around with a, a vision of um, what the world is like in our head. And, and part of that is a vision of what is going to happen. Uh, and uh, what I have learned in the last four months, um, the entire world, uh, is that that vision can be toppled instantly um, without warning. Um, or <laughs> even though we were warned against pandemics many, many times, um, uh, without our recognition of, of the possibility. And it's that lack of recognition that, that, that is the issue. It's, it's, it's not that pandemics weren't predicted. 
prediction, even if it were possible um, for, for something like this, is not really the issue. It's the presence of that default assumption that um, it's not going to happen. Um, you know, not this year, not on my watch, uh, not in this company, uh, not for, for this country. Um, uh, we can be presented with all kinds of predictions and possibilities. Uh, uh, but if our default future doesn't contain the possibility of change, particularly those kinds of changes, then there's nothing we can do. So the very first thing we have to do is recognize the, uh, the blind spots that we already have. Okay, and then where do we go from there? And by the way, speaking of sort of like change and, and, and like we have this, this term now that's being thrown all over the, the, the place, new normal, some, some people call it post-normal. To me, that kind, kind of sounds strange and tell me if I'm right or wrong here or if I, because to me, there's never been something like really like normal. I mean, take mm. any epoch in the history of the last 10,000 years, which one is the normal one? Even in the last hundred years, change is the normal, normal. <laughs> <laughs> so when yes. people so when people say well the new normal what's different here i don't get it like it's changed that's normal so the new normal is just like the old normal it's changed that's what's normal the not normal thing is not change okay so if if things are if we live in a dead universe where nothing happens that would be a new normal compared to our current normal for the last 14 billion years, which is stuff happens all the time, everywhere in the universe constantly. That's my take on it. It's like, what do you think? Uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. Um, the, the, the issue with the new normal and with normal is, uh, again, around surprise. Um, so the pandemic was a, a, a big surprise, but now that it's here, we were we're living sort of past the surprise. We're we're, we're moving past the the stage of being surprised, uh, and that's what people I think mean when they refer to it as the new normal. Um, what's not normal is surprise, um, and what is normal is even the weirdest of situations that we might be living in. Um, changes that um, uh, we are aware of. I mean, one way to look at this is that we uh, uh, imagine that we have a, a language, a grammar for describing the world around us. And it has uh, words and it has sentences that you can build with those words. Uh, and we can combine those, those, those things in all kinds of ways uh, to describe the world. Um, and then some, something comes along that we don't have a word for. Um, for a while, what we feel is just a sense of disorientation. Um, something's different, but we literally can't describe it. So um, it's, not, it's not part of our mental landscape. Um, it's this period of disorientation that you know, we lived through yeah, well, and to some extent, we're still living through now as, 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 as we adjust. Um, in the long run, we'll come up with new words, w w new language that we understand for these things. But um, there's that, that phase when something is happening, but we don't have the language for it, and therefore can't recognize it and bring it into our conversations. That is um, incredibly important for us to uh, uh, be aware of. Um, and you're right, change is happening all the time. So therefore, we're getting little doses of, of, of these kinds of, of new, new things all the time. But normally, it doesn't overwhelm us because we can just revert back to our, you know, the, the full scale grammar that we have and, and talk around things. The pandemic doesn't allow us to talk around it. Uh, so uh, it, it's uh, what uh, the philosopher Alain Badiou calls an event, um, something that is a discontinuity, a complete break from what we've had before. And we have yeah. to invent new ways. It's a singularity of, of a... It is, it, it, quite literally, yeah. So we, we have to invent new language 
um, to be able to, to deal with it. But we can proactively invent language for things that have not occurred yet. Um, one of the tools we use uh, to do that is science fiction. Um, so we, you know, we have words like terraforming. Um, terraforming has never been done. There is no, you know, science of terraforming. There isn't an institute of, of terraforming. Um, people don't get degrees in terraforming. And Not so on consciously. And so forth. So yet, I mean, you can say that everything we've done to the planet for the last ten thousand years has been terraforming, but it's not been. I mean, global warming is terraforming, right? But it's not been designed or 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 uh, sort of deliberate or conscious. It's been just like a byproduct of what we've been doing in a way. Isn't that make sense? That is exactly what I'm saying. What you've just done is shown how a term that was invented for something that doesn't exist um, can suddenly become relevant and applicable to the situation that we're in. Uh, even though there, there's no institute of, uh, of, of, for, for terraforming um, and there's no science of doing it, we're suddenly realizing that, oh, we understand this idea. We understand this word be and, and, and we can see that we're doing it. With, without that word, we would be lacking part of our grammar for understanding global warming and the situation that we're in. So, um, so part of what uh, uh, futurism does is um, try and find new terms and terminologies, uh, new language for describing things that don't necessarily uh, yet exist, but um, uh, which uh, kind of like are like new tools in our, our, our toolkit. And when we need them, we can reach in and pull them out. That's fantastic. Yeah, and we'll come back later to the topic of the importance of language when we move on to narrative. But uh, so let's say we've recognized the fact that we would be surprised that predicting the future is uh, impossible uh, and that our so-called norm or, or, or model uh, or normal will be disrupted and, and on our watch, on our shift, that will happen. So let's say you're hired by the Canadian government or by one of the major corporations which are struggling right now. Uh, I don't know, three or four months ago, how would you lay down the principles or the steps after uh, or the tools they can use together with you under your guidance uh, after that first step that you said we all have to begin with? Well, you have to know what the organization um, wants, right? Um, the, for for a foresight engagement, um, they generally don't come out of the blue. They're 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 typically um, uh, about the strategic plan for the organization. Um, so, for instance, work that I've done for the Canadian military uh, was uh, primarily about preparing. Um, junior officers to become uh, colonels and generals 30 years down the line. Um, so what they wanted to do was they wanted to lay the seeds now for the thinking that these people would need to be able to do 25 years from now. So let's say I'm the president of the United States and I have the foresight to come and hire Carl Schroeder because I think you're the best. And I tell you, Carl, how does the United St States enter the 2020s? What would your expertise in foresight help me do or see or prepare for? What kinds of steps should I take? What kind of things should I watch out for? Help me out. Well, um, uh, you want to know what your... Uh, expectations are about the future. Uh, so you want to know what your default future is. What do you think can't change? Well, the United States has to be the best, most pop, uh, most uh, powerful militarily, politically, economically country. We want to retain uh, our global dominance, of course. Well, that's a goal, um, which is a little bit different from your, your, your default assumptions. Um, so, uh, but a clearly defined goal like that is uh, is often necessary for a, a, a foresight engagement. Um, okay, so that's the strategic aim. 
Um, now you, you can sort of see that foresight um, is actually only one part of, in this case, um, a planning process. So it falls at a, a particular step in the strategic planning um, uh, uh, sort of workshop or, 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 or uh, project that you're in. Uh, and uh, typically, this is exactly how it works. Um, you've got a, a, a strategic um, planning operation that you're doing, and it involves many different parts, including you know, assessing what your uh, competitive landscape looks like, uh, um, uh, uh, what your goals as an organization are, uh, what the industry as a whole looks like. Um, foresight comes in uh, basically in the middle of that, to interrogate um, your assumptions and to create a spectrum of possibilities. Um, and this is where we don't do the predicting. Um, you, you, you say, this is what's going to happen. Um, you look at trends, you look at uh, possible discontinuities. Um, uh, uh, by interrogating your assumptions, you can say, well, you know, maybe there'll be a pandemic, um, right? What will happen if uh, all the cars go off the road for, for four months? Uh, let's say we're talking to the oil industry, right? That's um, impossible, Carl. That could never happen. It's right, never it's, happened. Even in the sure, it, 1970s oil embargo, we still had cars on the road and it could never happen. It's impossible. Right. And we get that a lot. Right, because that's <laughs> that is the default future. The default future contains nothing that doesn't already exist, usually. Um, and uh, uh, impossible is 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 the word that's most often used. Um, this can't change. Um, so you go looking for ways in which it it might actually be changing, um, and you explore ways that it could change, and then you ask what could you do if it did change? In other words, what's your current state of resilience? Um, are you able to sustain a shock like that? So for a lot of organizations, or for instance, uh, 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 Canadian provinces who are invested in um, uh, one primary Like Alberta industry, in, in the oil sands? Yeah, you, you ask, um, well, what would happen if this crashed are you diversified do you have a plan for diversification clearly the they're not well they've, they've had many opportunities and they, they've done a lot of work towards that uh, and uh in fact um alberta um has if not the most um uh, uh, futurists um working in government it's got a, a lot of uh, professional futures, very, very good ones. Um, and they, they do this kind of exercise, yeah, yeah. So, so um, why do I not get the vibe that they're, they've been prepared at all for any change or pushing for any change for the last decade, but they've been basically, instead of forward looking, that's my sort of non-professional, partial and skewed subjective personal observation is that they've been stubbornly refusing to look forward into the future, but stuck in a sort of, late 19 early 20th paradigm that they're refusing to move away from that's my view well uh, the, uh, the what i would say to that is who's this they that you're referring to because um uh, right so um the 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 this this brings us to a really really important part of foresight which is who is your customer uh, and how much um uh, power does your customer have uh, uh, usually, uh, foresight is brought into an organization by some kind of internal champion, somebody who believes in the process, understands it, um, and can see the need for, um, uh, for building that kind of resilience. Um, and uh, as a foresight professional, you may be brought in to uh, do workshops, to uh, create scenarios, uh, uh, all kinds of things. But the, the fundamental question in the end is, at what level are you speaking? Are you talking to uh, some line manager um, who has a budget that they need to spend who brought you in? Or are you talking to the CEO who actually has the power to implement changes? 
Just listening to the speeches Jason Kenney has been giving for the last three years, uh, and even before that with the NDP government, their position was not that much different with respect to oil and so on. Sure. Um, and that speaks to where, um, at what governmental level, foresight is being done and what is being done with the results, right? Um, and as, as, a, as a foresighter, as a futurist, you don't control that. Uh, un unless you, you set yourself up as a, a public uh, pundit, um, like Alvin Toffler did, for instance, and speak to the whole plan, um, and, and, and somehow, yeah, and somehow manage to get everyone's attention. Um, Future Shock, um, uh, both as a book and as a concept, um, was designed to do that, uh, to m basically to make an end run around uh, organizational structures. Um, you know, if everybody in your companies bought the book or at least knows how to have a, a water cooler conversation about it, you as the CEO find it a lot harder to dismiss the ideas that go along with it. Um, so uh, as part of um, uh, a foresight project, you don't have any more control over the outcome than any other um, person involved in strategic planning. Um, take a strategic planning exercise that is entirely now based, uh, based on say a competitive analysis uh, or a blue ocean analysis of, uh, uh, of, of where other companies in your space are at. Um, the odds of you getting that implemented at the top level are the same as the odds of uh, uh, you know uh, a set of foresight scenarios being acted upon. Um, so. Uh, there has in the past been um, a, a, a lot of um, acceptance uh, at high levels in Canada for, uh, for foresight. Again, in, in the military, uh, it's never gone away. Uh, 20 years ago, the uh, National Science uh, Council um, had a, a foresight arm that was run by Jack Smith, um, who was my mentor and who... Um, uh, single-handedly sort of built that capacity. Well, not single-handedly. I could name a lot of different uh, people who contributed. But, uh, but, but Jack was instrumental to uh, bringing together all kinds of Canadian stakeholders at, at high levels of government. Um, unfortunately, successive governments dismantled that capacity. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, uh, th there's all kinds of things that can interfere uh, in real politic terms with uh, foresight getting done. But because that's entirely out of my control, uh, that's not something that I, you know, uh, uh, typically worry about. I, I worry about the, uh, my ability to communicate and uh, uh, educate the people that I'm actually working with. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so, so let's talk about, so, so you have a, a number of tools which allow you to sort of like uh, perceive and evaluate and maybe even inform and guide you as per what to do within different possible scenarios. And one such tool that we touched upon uh, during our previous conversation was strange making. So can you perhaps share with us, first of all, what is strange making in general? Uh, it's uh, usually got two components to it. Um, uh, it's deeply wrapped up with what I've actually been, been talking about, about the, 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 the default feature. Um, and uh, the, the first part is um, learning to make the familiar strange. Um, so uh, making people wake up to um, just how um, out of equilibrium uh, their situation might be. You might think it's normal uh, for uh, you know, a city of 4 million people to be pouring immense amounts of gasoline into their cars and, 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 and all of them driving you know, past each other in, in, in various differ different directions, you know, miles and miles away from where they live to uh, work for eight hours and then all jumping in their cars and driving all the way, the, the way home. Um, 
But when you're immersed in that lifestyle, uh, you don't see it. So finding a way uh, to get people to to see that is um, uh, the, the first component. Uh, the the pandemic has done that. It has strange made commuting for us. Suddenly, we're recognizing that this was an odd, out of whack situation that we were living in all along. Right? Um, Maybe the, even the obsolete second part, in many ways. Yes. Uh, well, it could be now, but that's sort of the next stage in our thinking, right? Um, but the 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 next step is to make the uh, the strange familiar. Um, so once uh, once you've opened the door to the possibility that things could be different, um, you enable so many um, uh, options for people. To get to those options, they have to be able to um, imagine the world as different. And normalizing those differences uh, is the other part of strange making. So when I, I talked about terraforming uh, earlier, that's an example of uh, taking the strange and making it uh, familiar. Uh, this, the specific move in that case is to, is to say, uh, oh, we have been terraforming the earth using fossil fuels. That's a, a strange making move that, that takes um, what was unfamiliar and, and normalizes it. Mm -hmm. so, so let's take the current ongoing uh, COVID-19 global pandemic. Um, and, and you said, maybe we didn't recognize it most of us didn't and even like we did our previous interview i think it was uh what was it march 5th 4th 5th somewhere thereabouts and yeah. it, we were sort of just at the very beginning and i mentioned it a couple of times briefly but we never focused on it and kind of i was kind of i even had conversations with other people that you know it's inevitably going to come here and it's going to be bigger than we expected but i never even recognized how big it will be Mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't kind of cover it sufficiently. So let's see now, first of all, what can we learn by the, the surprising um, emergence uh, of this previously unrecognized future that we, is now our present called COVID-19 global pandemic? And secondly, how can we strange make or can we strange make or what can we make out of it? now that we're here yeah well uh, there's a um an old saying in in, in science fiction uh, it's been attributed to several people uh, it might be larry niven who said it first that the, uh, the the science fiction writer's job is not to imagine the automobile but to imagine the traffic jam uh and in the, in the case of a global pandemic uh what we were able to imagine was uh, the automobile, basically. We were able to imagine the, uh, uh, the fact of it and uh, uh, what, you know, how a global health response might play out on the institutional level. Um, but what we couldn't imagine was that we might walk out um, at eight in the morning uh, on a sunny day in a city of, again, you know, this one is uh, about three and a half, four million people, and hear nothing but birds, um, and look up and see a, a perfectly blue sky. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, it, we didn't connect the idea of a pandemic with the idea that uh, wildlife would be um, penetrating the cities, or that people would be walking down the, the, the middles of the road. Um, or that people would be enjoying um, this quiet uh, and, and finding something uh, th there that they had forgotten that they'd lost. Um, so uh, the, the strange for the pandemic for us has uh, almost by definition come from unexpected directions. It's, it, it's come from, um, you know, the, the first three weeks of uh, the, the, the toilet paper uh, crisis. <laughs> <laughs> um, to predict the pandemic meant, if you're really going to do it, to predict that people would be hoarding 
um, toilet paper and ignoring all the food uh, on, on the shelves. Um, in, in the usual zombie apocalypse uh, scenario, it's the other way around. You get people camping out in fortresses with you know mountains of canned goods. Um, no, that's not what happened. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, it's it's the things that were expected that didn't happen uh, that uh, are really our uh, uh, our indicators um, for how to look at at, at change. Um, there there hasn't been mass panic, you know. There there has been a, an immense outpouring of co community um, spirit and community support. Um, things like this. Well, but there's been a lot of resistance too. You have armed militias uh, storming the state government uh, in a number of states in the United States, basically. I mean, thankfully, without like any actual violent, you know, armed confrontation, but basically the police let them kind of march in. Uh, and they were very heavily armed with like, you know, assault rifles and tons of ammo and you name it. And, and uh, even in Washington, D.C., we had lots of anti-quarantine uh, demonstrations. Michigan was, of course, the most kind of probably the prototypical, most notorious place. But that happened all over. Uh, so... I, yeah, you, you give us a very kind of optimistic take, and I'm happy to, to hear that, but there were a lot of darker elements that emerged too, I think. Oh, sure, absolutely. I'm not denying that at all. Um, uh, although people uh, uh, have a tendency to think uh, in, in post-apocalyptic terms in an entirely negative way, which was uh, part of my point, that... Um, uh, a, a lot of uh, the, the bad stuff that was expected did not happen. Now, with regard to those protesters, and I think it's Minnesota, uh, what they've discovered is that when they went home, uh, they took COVID-19 with them. And now it's breaking out in, uh, uh, in rural communities where otherwise it would have taken a long time. Yeah. It would otherwise take a long time to get there. Um, but for, for foresight, that again is a really good example. Uh, you might predict the protesters, but um, the important thing it would have been to predict uh, the outbreaks that they would cause when they went home. Because the, uh, a proper um, foresight-based reaction or, or, or plan um, around uh, those protesters would have said, well, let's ignore the protesters, but let's go to rural Minnesota and build a pandemic plan there because we know they're going to bring it back with them. That's the important thing, not the protest. The protest is just a protest. But, the, uh, but people are going to die in rural Minnesota, and that is uh, life and death. Yeah, that's very, very sad. Uh, but but let's say if we can call the global COVID-19 pandemic the car, then what would be the traffic jam that we should have predicted with the help of foresight? Or now that it's easier because we already have the car in the shape of a pandemic, what would be the equivalent of the traffic jam that we should see, that we must see from this situation? Well, I think... Uh... There's going to be a lot of things. One of them is uh, the uh, the collapse of fossil fuel industries. Um, uh, the 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 dominant narrative is still that they're going to recover, and in fact, yes, they will. We we do need uh, to get back on the road, but there's going to be far far fewer of us. Um, uh, Twitter, for instance, has just announced that it's uh, uh, making work at home uh, an option forever. for all its employees forever. Yeah. A lot of other companies are going to follow suit. Um, so there will be a, a, a massive impact on commercial real estate um, it, for the long term. Um, and that, again, is something that should have been built into pandemic uh, response plans. Um, I don't know that it was. Um, the, the fossil fuel industries uh, are basically resting on top of... Uh, at least a trillion dollars worth of stranded assets 
this is oil and gas that can never be burned because if it was burned, um, our, the global temperature would shoot above intolerable levels. Uh, but their valuations as companies have depended on these assets. One of the things that's going to happen, even once we all get back on the road, is that those stranded assets are going to be considered stranded. So there's going to be a trillion dollar write down of the values of these companies, even if we all go back uh, to our commuting lifestyle. Um, and knock-on effects like that are, are what are really, really difficult to predict. Um, and again, if, if, you're, if your aim is to predict, then um, uh, yeah, the, the traffic jam is really hard to see in advance. But um, uh, what you can do is you can um, come up with what we call uh, scenarios, particularly wildcard scenarios. And uh, that's always a plural. There's always more than one. So give us um, several look... wildcard scenarios, perhaps. Well, we're living in one. Um, the, we're living in the ultimate wildcard scenario for the beginning of the, the 21st century. It's when something completely unexpected comes in and changes the entire uh, nature of the situation. So, um, first contact with an alien civilization is a you know um, a wild card uh, scenario. Uh, for energy, wild card scenario is uh, the sudden uh, invention of uh, cheap nuclear fusion, for instance. Um, the 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 problem with uh, wild card scenarios. Uh, no, not by itself, because everybody expects it. Um, and and is planning for it. Uh, so not by itself. It's the thing that it's out there, um, and you may so know about genetics it. like CRISPR, uh, genetic manipulation such as CRISPR would also fall under that sort of like expectation, therefore not really a wild card. Uh, not by itself. Again, it's something that might happen because of CRISPR um, that uh, could be a could wild be the card. wild card. Yeah. Right, so, so for instance, with AI, yeah, go ahead. Uh, for instance, a genetically tailored disease. So a new pandemic that was artificially created, unlike this one, which is natural. Mm -hmm. uh, or, for example, some kind of a uh, wild card potential scenario as a byproduct of the invention of AI. What? Yes. what g give me one possible qu qu uh, uh, candidate for that. Uh, with regard to AI? Yes. Um, uh, well, uh, I, I, I have one that I'm working on right now with a, 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 a foresight group that I can't talk about. <laughs> I really want to. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, what else can I talk about? Um, the uh, Second best. Give us your second well, best. Yeah. You know, again, be, be, because wild cards really are um, uh, about what you're not thinking about, I wouldn't even go to a AI. Um, I, I would go to something else, like, for instance, um, uh, astrophysics discovers that the universe, or that the Big Bang was not the beginning of the universe, that in fact the universe is, is cyclic, eternal, um, and... Um, uh, uh, um, will uh, re repeat what's happening, um, or, you know, uh, th this is just one of an endless cycle of uh, 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 repeating universes. Now, this is um, something that could have a effect on society, on religion, um, on, on how we view ourselves as human beings, right? Um, Basically, or Hinduism will become physics. <laughs> Right, uh, uh, and and that sort of thing is absolutely um, not that particular case, but that kind of a discovery is an absolute possibility that we have to 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 be aware of. So when we strange make our near future, um, let's say that, that we're dealing now with a future in which we understand ourselves to be living in an eternally recurrent um, physical universe. Um, uh, another good example would be integrated information theory, which is a, a new candidate for a, a, a theory of consciousness, 
theory of the mind. What is really interesting about IIT is that um, it purports to be able, uh, able to allow you to um, uh, instrumentally and mathematically distinguish between a conscious system and an, a non-conscious system. So you can design two computers and, and they're, they're, they both talk to you. They're both AIs and they, they, um, and they both seem to be um, conscious. But you can prove that one of them is and the other one is just pretending. Um, not only that, you can say with absolute certainty that your cat or dog or uh, the cattle that are marching into the slaughterhouse have minds and conscious uh, experiences. Um, so again, what does that do to society? Does this make everyone into vegetarians? Or does it start a war over um, uh, the rights of, uh, of animals, for instance? Um, this, again, is something that is an absolute possibility based on uh, uh, you know, science that's actually out there in the wild right now. And, and yeah, it creates a wild card situation. So, as you said, we are living in one of those wild card situations right now. And uh, last time when we were talking about uh, your book, we were talking about uh, some examples about uh, a freedom within limits and how, as you said, we have infinite possibilities or infinite degree, degrees of freedom within a very narrow uh, actual range of, of, of actions or, or possible futures that, that we can sort of go along. Uh, and, and how we were uh, talking about the example of a uh, hammer, uh, which uh, is, is always perceived as a hammer until it, it's broken. And then suddenly you have the possibility of perceiving it as something different, of using it for something different. And 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 of of seeing it in a totally new new light so let's see if or how maybe we can take that kind of reasoning and learning and adapt it if we can to our current covid-19 situation what is it that got broken and what is it that 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 we have new freedom to do today that we didn't have before um, well, it's pretty clear what got broken, and, and, and uh, at least in uh, places like the United States, and that was the, uh, the naive idea of personal freedom. Um, so when all those protesters went out and said, uh, well, you can't make me not go to work, um, they didn't realize that they were not arguing with other human beings about this. They were arguing with um, uh, an agent, a non-human agency, loose in their environment that was trying to kill them. <laughs> um, and uh, but but that's no uh, laughing matter. I, but I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, but but I I I think that we talked about um, uh, last time the the fact that um, one of the theories of change that people often have is that change happens because. People People make things change. And if a person doesn't make something change, then it doesn't change. Uh, ergo, if something changes, it's because somebody made a change. And uh, therefore, uh, if um, COVID-19 is raging across the planet, it's because somebody made it happen. Uh, it was developed in a lab by this logic. Um, uh, it was allowed to flourish, or it is a political tool. It doesn't really exist, but uh, people are uh, saying that it exists. Um, this kind of thinking leads you to um, uh, view the universe as consisting of nothing but human beings um, and their, their various political ploys. And in that case, yeah, um, COVID-19 is nothing but another political ploy. So you fight back against that the way you always fight, fight back, by protesting, right? By blaming, um, by, by all the, the, the normal uh, str strategies. Um, and uh, um, the problem is that you're not dealing with that kind of an agent of change. So these guys are going to get sick. They're going to go home and they're going to uh, pass on the sickness to their own loved ones. It's a tragedy. And um, 
it's it's a tragedy that's nobody's fault. Um, so that was, you know, the 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 hammer breaking sort of moment um, for a lot of people. But the the question of um, what can change positively, well, uh, I think we're seeing that already. That uh, people are talking uh, in many countries uh, about the uh, economic recovery having to be a green recovery that this is a historical moment in which, because everything's shut down anyway, we can restart our uh, institutions in different configurations. Um, and uh, uh, yes, we absolutely can, because so much of uh, the world that we live in is a, a consensus reality. Um, it's, the, uh, it's the world that we agree exists. Um, now we have the chance to uh, restart it uh, with a new agreement in place. I agree with you. I agree with you. But the, the problem is that it seems to me that that's not, not necessarily the agreed narrative or consensus. And, and we're going, that will be our next topic. But just to grab that thought here and focus on it for a second is I'm not convinced that Alberta in any way, shape or form wants to sort of like go green right now. I, I hope I'm wrong and I hope that they would. And I hope they use this tremendous opportunity to do just that because Calgary is like the highest uh, solar uh, powered I mean, uh, the city of Calgary receives the highest amount of solar energy per square meter than any other city in Canada, just to give you one example. Mm -hmm. And yet that's that means nothing to them, it seems to me. Uh, and it's not, I haven't seen it as part of the official provincial narrative or discourse or even as debate. It, it's all about basically give us the, the support and the money to basically resurrect uh, the oil and gas industry and bring back the previous normal, the, the, the bring back time basically. That's what they're trying to accomplish despite, and, and Fort McMurray is a great example of that. You know, it's been burned it's been flooded right now it's been under quarantine and yet every time it's the same exact story let's rebuild exactly as we were before instead of like well maybe we shouldn't be building here if we're in a floodplain and if we're like in the in the path of a forest fire and we know with global warming there will be more flooding and there will be more forest fires than ever before so maybe it's not such a smart thing to rebuild exactly the same as it was before, but yet that's what we keep pushing for, at least there, and that's what we keep getting. And I mean, even Trudeau bought the, the pipeline uh, and is now pushing, giving billions of dollars to those companies. So, so I'm, I'm not... Well, you realize what, sure, you realize what you're doing though. You're, you're describing your default future. You're, you're telling me what's impossible. Well, um, I, I am afraid that but, but I... can can I continue though? Um, uh, sure, uh, and and uh, that's part of um, you know the the default future is is um, uh, based on everything we've seen so far. We're not going to get a pandemic, right? Um, so, but the the other part of it is that you know you're absolutely right. No, people are not going to agree. You know, not the, the whole world is not going to suddenly link hands, um, and you know, and sing kumbaya and, and 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 march down this path. No, some places will, and some places won't. Uh, when we talk about the future, and we when we talk about trends, we always talk about trends and counter trends, uh, things that are going one way, and the forces that are pushing back or are going the other way, because there are always you know um, uh, movements in both directions. Uh, and, and yeah, you, you need to take that into account. It's normal. That's a normal part of, uh, of foresight to, uh, to be aware of uh, uh, both trend and counter trend. All I was saying in this case was that um, this is the opportunity. And a lot of uh, places, a lot of jurisdictions, whether they're national or, or urban, for instance, are very vocally recognizing and uh, signing on to the opportunity for change. Um, will there be resistance? Of course there will. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Uh, it, it's just like 
Yeah, I, well, as, as Gibson has said, the, you know, this future will be here, but not evenly distributed. Uh, I'll tell you one place it's not going to happen, Brazil. Bolsonaro is taking Brazil, yeah. you know, entirely down the, the, the wrong path. Yeah. Um, although, you know, it may result in a coup or a revolution uh, if things get bad enough. Um, and maybe they'll go green faster than anybody else. We we cannot predict. The the the, the point is not to predict, but to um, uh, understand how would we deal with um, a Brazil still ruled by Bolsonaro, and how could we prepare for a Brazil that had actually turfed him out and uh, and gone green suddenly? Uh, these are scenarios. These are options, and we have to un recognize the possibility of each of them. Well, Carl, we are getting towards the end of our conversation here. So let me just bring in the power or the importance of, a, of the narrative, of the story, uh, when it comes to this kind of especially strange making uh, or, or scenarios. And because each scenario that you're talking about in Foresight is basically another story. It's basically a story. And, 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 a wild card is basically a story that we didn't think of or we didn't think it was important or we didn't think it's going to to be possible right those are just wild card stories right so so talk to me and and, and it seems to me that that right now whether and i would love if calgary and alberta in general becomes a wild card in 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 this uh kind of opportunity that you're telling us and i totally agree with you we live in right now to to break through to to break apart from the past and sort of create a new green green new deal if you will as so many as you pointed out are pushing for but they if they have this dominant story that's from the past isn't it the case that the first step to break through to break apart from the past is like coming up with a new story and somehow selling it to the people, selling it to the companies, selling it to the leaders, selling it to the decision makers, right? And in a way, if you can say the crisis that we live in right now is maybe arguably not really a climate crisis as much as a, a climate of, 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 of a consensus about the common story, right? Because once one group of people says, well, we live in a climate crisis. Other people say, no, that's the story of the invention of the of the left uh, who are trying to impose their radical leftist agenda on us or something like that. And there's a bunch of different stories, obviously, in between them. But so uh, you could say that, you know, the, it's harder and harder to make sense of life because everything is changing all the time at a faster and faster place. And our civilization is trying to react to and keep up with all kinds of exponential changes and pandemics and everything that's happening. Maybe because we lack this narrative that could accommodate for, um, explain um, and, and inform us maybe even about what can we expect and what we can do about those things, right? Where's the narrative coming here? Where's the storytelling coming in here? Well, a lot of people are working on just that. Um, and there is, in fact, a new um, uh, uh, discipline in design called uh, transition design, uh, which uh, is, is all about um, designing or, or, or finding the appropriate uh, language uh, to describe uh, positive changes that we need to make. Um, and that language is, is uh, almost inevitably uh, a narrative. Um, uh, discursive design is, is another very recent um, development in, in design. And, and uh, so a, a lot of people are working on it. And um, yes, narrative is central to this because uh, uh, while humans have developed many, many different techniques over the millennia for um, describing uh, regular processes in, in nature, um, mathematics being, uh, you know, the, the, the ultimate tool for that. Uh, we have also, in parallel, developed one tool specifically designed for describing unique events, uh, and that is narrative. Uh, narrative is what we use to describe um, 
things that uh, basically agent-based changes that um, can only be well, uh, no, a specific kind of change, changes that 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 um, can only be understood in terms of history and context. Um, so a tornado, for instance, we understand tornadoes in an abstract sense, but any given tornado it has a story uh, of where it touched down, um, or what it threw around, the path that it took, um, the, the the specific damage that it that it caused. That is the story of that particular tornado. Um, and while we may understand, you know, broad historical changes like recessions and so forth, um, or even pandemics, uh, the only way that we can properly understand any given one is to tell its story. So what uh, a lot of people are trying to do right now is tell new stories about the future. And I, I'm, I'm doing that as well. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the story of the civilization that comes after ours. And I'm interested in that story not being uh, the triumphalist, colonialist, um, space colonization uh, future in which we master science and technology um, and, 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 you know, pave the earth. Um, and I am interested in that story being a triumphal story for humanity at the same time. Uh, I'm not interested in post-apocalyptic narratives that are, are, are dystopian and so forth, because we've done that. We have that particular deck of uh, cards that we can draw on. Um, but what we need now is we need uh, uh, hopeful narratives that provide us templates for building stuff, and whether it be institutions, uh, legal frameworks, um, ways of living our lives. That guide and inform us how to adapt to that change and, 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 and what to aim towards and, and what to yeah. build and what to look forward to and what to strive for and what to aspire for and what to dream for. Yeah, absolutely. And, the, and they can't be based on a prediction. The, uh, you know, we can't like Elon Musk say, well, we will build a second home for humanity and move to Mars. And um, we can't say that we will develop a magical technology that fixes global warming. And we can't say that global warming will overwhelm us or that society will collapse or, or any of these things. We, we have to speak forward into uncertainty and, and say, this could happen, this could happen. Uh, but more importantly, I hope this happens. I want this to happen. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and give ourselves directions. And maybe uh, this should happen. Right. Yes. Not only what is and will happen, but what should happen. And there's a very important concept in, in foresight called the aspirational future, the, the future that you aspire to. Um, and uh, we, we have and we're developing more techniques for um, taking an aspirational future and then building the roadmap to get there. Uh, always understanding, as with any plan, um, that uh, you know th things will change along the way. But um, uh, uh, if the transition design um, can, and if the, the 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 storytellers of the world can find new aspirational futures that converge um, in a way uh, that we can all act together, we may not all have the same aspirations, but if they're close enough um, that we can agree on what to do, then um, the, 20, the rest of the 21st century could be a very exciting uh, place to live. Yes, and, and uh, you said that you're interested in that kind of future, and I'm interested in, in your next book, uh, uh, depicting and creating uh, and imagining that kind of future for us all. So I'm very much looking forward to it. Carl, I'm afraid I can speak to you forever, as always, because I find it tremendously stimulating and very enriching. But unfortunately, we're again out of time. So tell us quickly, what's the best place for people to find more about you and your work? Uh, well, I, I have a website at uh, kschrader.com. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, my handle there is uh, uh, just Carl Schrader. 
Um, so uh, I, I try and keep people uh, up to date um, through those venues. Um, uh, and I would encourage uh, everybody to, to go out and, and uh, look up transition design um, and uh, be open to uh, all the new generation of really exciting science fiction and fantasy writers out there who are imagining and aspiring in exactly the way that we've talked about um, and uh, are, who are richly deserving of, uh, of attention. Uh, Isaac Asimov and the foundation uh, is just so 20th century. We have to get past it. <laughs> and there's a lot of really good writers out there that, uh, 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 that are doing ex exciting work right now that, that uh, I hope will inspire people. So it's time to move beyond Isaac Asimov's foundation series and predicting the the future and predicting history or future history uh, and and sort of embrace the new generation of science fiction authors who are imagining and, and creating this kind of aspirational future. I would say you're definitely one of them. Uh, and, and that's why I always follow your work. So is that the parting message you want us to to uh, part ways today with. We've been talking today for over an hour about uh, strange making, COVID-19, and the importance of narrative a little bit. Is that the parting message? What, what, what do you want it to be? Uh, I hope that people recognize the power of imagination at, at, at this point um, and the unlimited possibilities um, that are, are ahead of us. Um, when you feel walled in by the future, um, more often than not, it's because uh, you don't recognize the blind spots of your own default future. Um, so let's start knocking those uh, those walls down. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, science fiction just being one of them. But uh, strange, make the world for yourself and um, uh, uh, find the things that, 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 that can change and imagine that they will change. And um, uh, have a little faith in the future, <laughs> because we can we can build the one that we want. Strange, make the world for yourself, uh, personally and collectively. And science fiction can help us start breaking down those walls uh, that that limit or or keep us trapped into our normalized future. I think that's a fantastic message, Carl Schroeder. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me, Nicola. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. 